The biggest and the most dangerous one certainly is the thing in the Ukraine. It has the prospect of turning into World War III. In fact, as we speak, it is turning into World War III. Uh, the uh, NATO countries, which is really to say the U.S., have backed the Russians into a corner, and the Russians are going to have to react. Now, how they react, I don't know. Uh, it, that's unpredictable. Governments today resemble expansive entities that have grown exponentially from their modest origins a century ago, when they typically consume just 5% to 10% of a country's GDP. This growth, often likened to unchecked cancers, raises profound questions about fiscal sustainability and the evolving role of governance in modern societies. Amidst the tapestry of global conflicts, few rival the complexity and volatility of the ongoing tensions between Russia and Ukraine. What might appear as a mere border skirmish is steeped in centuries of geopolitical maneuvering and cultural significance. The very name Ukraine, translating to borderland, underscores its historical role as a buffer zone where peoples and armies have clashed and coexisted for millennia. Yet recent events have thrust this region into a perilous new chapter that threatens to echo the catastrophic conflicts of the past. Market trader Doug Casey emphasizes that the current crisis stems from NATO's eastward expansion following the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991. Originally conceived as a defensive alliance against Soviet influence, NATO's gradual absorption of former Warsaw Pact countries, such as Estonia, Lithuania, Latvia, and Romania, has redrawn geopolitical fault lines across Europe. The annexation of Crimea in 2014 and the subsequent unrest in eastern Ukraine after the Maiden Revolution have intensified tensions highlighting the region's strategic importance and the complex web of alliances and rivalries at play. Today, as Western powers, led by the United States, navigate a delicate balance of diplomacy and military readiness, Russia finds itself increasingly encircled by NATO's expanding reach. The West's support for Ukraine's aspirations to integrate into Western alliances like NATO and the European Union has compounded Moscow's anxieties, particularly given Ukraine's extensive border with Russia and deep historical ties. Now, we present the clips of Doug Casey's insights from his recent video. Before we continue to discuss this, please subscribe to our channel and activate the bell icon for timely updates. The last hundred years, roughly, the state itself has been all over the world. All governments have been growing like cancers. Typically, a hundred years ago, before World War I, I should say, uh, governments took five, maximum 10% of the GDP to sustain themselves. Now we're talking about 40, 50%, 60% in some cases. So I put that at the root of the problem. But uh, that's uh, theoretical and economic. Looking at these various wars, what's the big one? Well, it's the Ukraine, the dust up between the Ukraine and uh, Russia. It's insane. This is really nothing but a border war between two countries. And people forget that the word Ukraine means borderland. Uh, peoples and armies have been flowing across that area for a thousand years. In fact, you might recall when, you know, I don't know how much time we ought to talk about just that, because there are 50 of these things, as you pointed out, going on around the world. So how much detail should we spend on any of them? But the biggest and the most dangerous one certainly is the thing in the Ukraine. It has the prospect of turning into World War III. In fact, as we speak, it is turning into World War III. NATO countries, which is really to say the U.S., have backed the Russians into a corner, and the Russians are going to have to react. Now, how they react, I don't know. Uh, it, that's unpredictable. The only thing we have going uh, in our favor to save us from being turned into uh, cinders is the fact that Putin is uh, very well educated, very historically knowledgeable, very centered, thoughtful, and prudent, certainly by comparison with any of the other world leaders he's confronting. And I know it's very dangerous for me to say something like this. I'd be called a Putin apologist. I'm just uh, picking the best of a bad bunch, actually, when I say that. Now, with uh, the accession of the Ukraine, the, the Russians are especially concerned about that because the Ukraine has a 2,000-kilometer border with Russia. 
the West has been very, very aggressive. This whole thing with the Ukraine started, actually directly started in 2014 with the Maidan revolution. I think his name was Yanukovych, but uh, he was friendly to the interests of Russia. He was overthrown by a coup in the Ukraine and replaced with West-leaning people that wanted to get the Ukraine into uh, into NATO and uh, perhaps the European Union and so forth. What people have forgotten about that is that when that happened in 2014, uh, the Donbass provinces broke off. They seceded from the Ukraine. Why? Because they're populated almost entirely by Russians, Russian-speaking people. And Kiev, at that point, mounted a war against those provinces in which about 20,000 people killed. And we don't hear about this stuff in the West so much. In any event, Putin said that's got to end. That's what his, uh, his military adventure into the Ukraine was all about. I don't approve of that. I don't approve of one country invading another country, but he was trying to solve a problem. Uh, not in the optimal way, obviously. But since then, this thing has degenerated. And now, Biden and the U.S. don't even talk to the Russians. And when you're talking about something that could put us into World War III, it's, it, it's, it's actually quite idiotic not to even sit, sit down at a table and discuss the problem. The exponential rise of the U.S. national debt is staggering, soaring from $23.3 trillion in January 2020 to $34.7 trillion today, with an $11.4 trillion increase over just four years and five months. This rapid escalation, occurring amidst a period of robust economic growth post-pandemic, underscores the scale of fiscal challenges faced. Reflecting back to the turn of the century, when the national debt was a mere $5.6 trillion, the current figure represents more than a six-fold increase. This ballooning debt trajectory has persisted across administrations, spanning George W. Bush, Barack Obama, Donald Trump, and now Joe Biden, indicating bipartisan contributions to its expansion. Annual deficits, marking the gap between government spending and revenue within a fiscal year, have similarly grown over time. After surpassing $1 trillion for the first time in fiscal year 2009 during the financial crisis, deficits fluctuated before resuming their ascent to become a seemingly permanent fixture today. Doug Casey highlights global debt, particularly government debt, as a critical concern. He argues that much of this debt is consumption-driven rather than invested in productive endeavors. This debt burden, according to Casey, poses significant risks by potentially mortgaging future prosperity or eroding savings through inflationary pressures. He cautions that modern monetary policies, characterized by expansive money creation and persistent deficit spending, could exacerbate these challenges, leading to uncontrollable inflation and economic instability. Track record of humanity starting 12,000 years ago after the end of the last ice age, it's been up, 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 but up, up, up on a hyperbolically accelerating curve, especially since the Industrial Revolution. And there's no reason why that should end at this point with the evolution of nanotechnology and artificial intelligence and robotics and biotech and, and many other things. So there's lots of cause for optimism from a, that point of view. And the, the second reason is, is that the uh, average person is wired like a, in a way like a squirrel where we genetically feel we have to produce more than we consume and save the difference. Well, so you can last through the winter. So there's plenty of reason to be super optimistic about the future, and I am, okay? So why am I pessimistic about the next 10 years, at least? Well, the specter of war at this point uh, is, is building up, and the destruction from this coming war, nuclear, biological, cybernetic, is potentially much greater than World War II could be. And it could stop those two mainsprings that I mentioned that are keeping uh, mankind moving forward. One thing that people don't adequately consider is the amount of debt in the world. People look on debt as just something that's out there. It'll be handled. It'll be paid off. But what are we talking about with debt? Uh, most of the debt in the world, all of the government debt, quite frankly, which is most of the debt, 
is consumption debt. Uh, and when you have consumption debt, it means that it's not there to produce new things, build new factories or, or, or whatever. It can be paid off one of two ways, either by mortgaging your future uh, or by taking the savings of others in the past and dissipating it. So debt in itself is not a good thing, especially not government debt, which is always consumption debt as opposed to production debt. So that's a very big thing. The amount of regulation in the world, which is stopping uh, producers from producing and distorting the way the market works, that's a major thing. Inflation of the currency. I mentioned that one of the two things that make me optimistic about the future is that the average guy sets aside things, produces more than he consumes and saves. But what does he save in? He saves in the local currency. But if the local currency is destroyed, his savings are destroyed. I think inflation is going to get completely out of control. The rapid accumulation of debt across various countries, independent of specific figures, poses significant risks to economic stability and growth prospects. Governments must navigate this precarious situation with cautious fiscal policies to prevent potential crises and ensure sustainable development. What are your thoughts on this interview? Share with us in the comment section below. Also, ensure you like this video, subscribe to the channel, and turn on post notifications for more videos like this. Until next time.